once again to our uh, midweek service. We appreciate so much you being with us this evening. Uh, for all of our members, uh, you uh, have received the prayer list, and I, I hope that you'll use that to remember to pray for one another. Uh, for those who are visiting with us, we're certainly honored to have you to join with us tonight as we continue our Bible study uh, dealing with the dealing with the giants that we that we face in our life. If you have your Bibles, let's turn together to the book of Ephesians and chapter four. The book of Ephesians chapter four, while you're finding the place, uh, Charles Dickens, the great English author, in his book, Great Expectations, wrote about a young man named Pip, who was called to the home of Mrs. Havisheim. Uh, her house was kept dark with thick drapes. In fact, the only light in her house was the light of a candle. However, as Pip's eyes adjusted to the gloomy dimness, he could uh, begin to see that there was a tattered veil that was tossed behind the head of Mrs. Havisham. Uh, he could see that her gown that had once been dazzling white was now, it was now all faded, colored with age. He could also see that she was only wearing one shoe and that the other shoe was on her dressing table ready to be worn and yet, yet it appeared that it had never been touched. But he also noticed that all of the clocks in her room were stopped at 9.20. They were stopped and the reason was simply because that was the time of day when she had learned that her fiance had married somebody else. The point was, it was at that moment, at 9.20, that her life and her mind, her life stopped. And she was unable to get past that. She was unable to get past it. You know, there are many today, even though the circumstances may differ, they're in the same situation. And, and the reason is simply because they have been overcome by what we will call the giant of bitterness the giant of bitterness. Now, as you know, we're doing a series entitled Facing Your Giants. And so far in our study, we have seen how the giants that we often encounter in our life, they are, they're much bigger, they're much stronger than we are. And, and, and we also saw last time how that many times these giants that uh, come in our lives are actually giants that evolve out of circumstances that we face but we do not handle them very well. And with that as our introduction, we're going to begin dealing now with some of the, some of the specific giants that if, if, if we have not already done so, uh, we will certainly encounter at some point in our life. The first giant that we want to deal with, it's, it, it's a really big giant. It's a really strong giant. It's the giant of bitterness. Concerning this giant, you found Ephesians chapter 4 now. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 31, the Apostle Paul said, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. I want you to understand here just very, very simple thought, and that is this. No believer in Jesus Christ has a right to hold on to their bitterness. That, that is not our right. That, that is not a privilege that we have. Rather, we are to drive it out of our life. We're to drive it out. And to do that naturally is going to require action on our part. Because you see, you need to remember that we must release bitterness because bitterness will never release us. It will never release us. Bitterness is like a weed, and you can cut the tip off of that weed, but unless that weed is totally rooted out, you will never be free of it. It will keep coming back over and over and over again, and so it is with bitterness. If it is not rooted out, you'll never be free of it, and it will totally begin to control and to rule in your life. So I want us to notice a couple of things. I want us to notice a couple of things about, about this giant 
of bitterness. Notice number one, the contamination of it. The contamination of it. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14, the Apostle Paul said this. He said, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, the Greek word that is translated follow here in this text, it actually carries the idea to eagerly pursue, to eagerly pursue. And the two things that we are to eagerly pursue, according to this text, is that we are to eagerly pursue peace with all men, and we're to eagerly pursue holiness before God. And the only way we can do either one of those two things is by the grace of God. But when we fail to follow God's grace, in other words, when we fail to show to others, when we fail to extend to others, the same grace that God has shown to us when He forgave us and cleansed us and promised that He would remember our sins no more, uh, when we fail to show to others the same grace that God showed to us when he made us to become a child of God, John chapter 1, verse 12, through faith in Jesus Christ, uh, when we fail to extend to others the same grace that God has shown to us, when he gave to us an eternal inheritance that was reserved in heaven for us, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, then if we fail to do that, notice the result. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. We find the root of bitterness springing up to trouble you, and thereby many are, notice the word, many are defiled. That's the contamination of bitterness. It defiles you. It defiles the way you think. It defiles the way you act. It defiles us on every level. You see, if we are not eagerly pursuing peace with men by extending grace to them, then we cannot pursue holiness before God. Did you, did you understand that? Let me say that again. If we are not eagerly pursuing peace with men by extending grace to them, then we cannot pursue holiness before God. And the reason is simply because when we refuse to show grace by forgiving others of the hurt and the wrongs that they have done to us, then the giant of bitterness begins to rise up in our lives. He takes a stronghold in our lives and he will defile us. That's the contamination the contamination of bitterness. I want you to notice number two. I want you to notice the cause of it. The cause of it. How does this giant of bitterness get a hold of us? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons or a couple of causes that we could mention. Uh, letter A, it comes because of the fact that we ignore God's providence. We ignore God's providence. Last week, we talked about those hurtful messengers, those circumstances that come into our lives that, 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 cause, us, that cause us pain, that, that cause us to be hurt. And, and we talked about those hurtful messengers, but, but, but many times, as we mentioned last time, we become, we become angry with the messenger because we willfully ignore the fact that every messenger that comes into our lives is actually, it is a messenger from God. It's a messenger from God. And because we willfully ignore the loving kindness of our Heavenly Father, we despise the hardships that He allows to come into our lives. Because we ignore the loving kindness of our Heavenly Father, we, we despise the disappointments that He comes into our lives. And, and, and we begin to think somehow that God hates us because of the difficulties that he's allowed to come into our life. I remember years ago when our, when our boys were young, it came time for them to, to get, some, uh, get some immunizations, some shots. And, and so I, I remember we took 
took our boys down and uh, particularly Benjamin, he was sitting on my lap and there was a nurse that came on each side and, and, and I really felt sorry for the little fella. Uh, they, they came on each side and they counted one, two, three, and then they, and they, and they jabbed him uh, one in each thigh and they gave him the shots that he needed. And, 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 and you know the reason why, the reason why that we allowed Benjamin uh, to go through that pain, to go through that difficult situation, it, it wasn't because we hated him. It wasn't because we were angry with him. It, it was because we loved him and because we knew that the pain would actually result in good. And, and, and you know, God does the very same thing with us as his children. Uh, God allows us to go through difficult hardships and difficult disappointments. He allows those things to come into our lives because he has something that is good for us that's going to come as a result of it. In, in fact, that's what the Bible says, Romans eight twenty eight. We're all familiar with it. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to to his purpose. But you see, if we, if we begin to ignore God's providence, if we ignore the fact that all of the hurts and the disappointments that we are facing, the hardships and the difficulties that, that we're having to deal with, uh, those come to us from the hand of a loving God. And if we're not careful, what happens is we begin to develop a bitter spirit. In other words, we have the same kind of spirit that Naomi had. In Ruth chapter 1, verse 20, after all of her hardships that she endured, she said, call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I read Hudson Taylor in his work, the works of J. Hudson Taylor. And, and, and here's what he said. He said, how the tendency to resentment and a wrong feeling would be removed. Could we take an injury from the hand of a loving father instead of looking chiefly at the agent through whom it comes to us? It matters not who is the postman, or as we said last week, the messenger. It matters not who is the postman. It is the writer of the letter that we are concerned. It matters not who is the messenger. It is with God that his children have to do. Oh, that we might understand the wonderful, loving providence of God. But if we ignore that, bitterness is going to come. Letter B, bitterness is also will come when we refuse giving release. When we refuse to give release, bitterness will come. The Bible tells us that in the reign of King David, uh, there was a fellow by the name of Ahithophel. Now, Ahithophel was uh, King David's most trusted counselor. In fact, when Ahithophel spoke, 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 23 tells us that when Ahithophel spoke, it was, it was like an oracle of God. I, I mean, when he spoke, people listened. People listened. In, in other words, it was just like hearing from, from God himself when Ahithophel would speak. And yet Absalom, you remember the story, Absalom sought to overthrow the throne of his father. He wanted to make himself to be the king of Israel. And so we find that Ahithophel went from being a trusted counselor to a vengeful enemy. Uh, I mean, it was a total turnaround. He went from being a trusted counselor to being a vengeful enemy. In fact, the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 31, that, that someone came and, uh, came and told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. He has switched sides. He is no longer to be trusted, but he has turned his back on you. Now he's following after your enemy. And of course, that raises the question, well, why did he do that? Why did Ahithophel make such a change? Well, you remember the tragic episode in King David's life, how that instead of leading his soldiers against Israel's armies, David had stayed at home. And then as he was walking on his roof one evening, you remember he, he saw a beautiful woman. And, and the problem was not that he saw her. The problem was he watched her. 
He gazed upon her. He saw this beautiful woman as, as she was bathing herself. And the Bible says in 2 Samuel 11 and verse 3, that David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Uh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, what is the connection with Ahithophel? What, what does this have to do with Ahithophel? Who was Eliam, the father of Bathsheba? Who, who, who was he? Well, the Bible gives us the answer, and it all ties together it all ties together in a very sad way. The Bible says in 2 Samuel 23, verse 34, that Eliam, notice it, Eliam, the son of Ahithophel, the Gileonite. In other words, when King David defiled Bathsheba, he defiled the granddaughter of Ahithophel. And, and, and when King David murdered Uriah the Hittite, Bathsheba's husband, he murdered the grandson-in-law of Ahithophel. In other words, Ahithophel had a very just cause to be really angry with David. But he ignored, or rather he allowed, he allowed his righteous anger to grow into an ungodly bitterness that caused him to be filled with a desire to commit his own murder. In fact, in 2 Samuel 17, verse 1 and 2, Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Let me now choose out 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue after David this night, and I will come upon him while he is weary and weak-handed, and will make him afraid. And all the people that are with him shall flee, and I will smite the king only. In other words, instead of taking the, set, the tragic situation, the difficult circumstances that had come into his life, instead of taking all that, turning it over to the Lord God and, and trusting God to deal with King David uh, for the terrible things that he had done, uh, Ahithophel just could not let it go. He could not let it go. And as a result, he became totally controlled by the giant of bitterness. And by the way, he was eventually destroyed by the giant of bitterness. You see, bitterness, bitterness comes when we refuse, when we refuse to accept God's providence. Uh, bitterness comes when we refuse to give release. And then thirdly, let her see, uh, bitterness comes when we have perceived rights. When we have perceived rights, uh, I, th I think a good example of this found in the story of Jonah. The Bible records for us how that God, uh, as Jonah was, was there by the city of Nineveh waiting to see what was going to happen, and, and, and he's sitting there and the sun is beating down on him, and, and, and God graciously caused a gourd to grow up and, and to shade him from the sun. But then God allowed the worm to eat the gourd. God allowed a worm to eat the gourd, and it died. And so the Bible says in Jonah chapter 4, verse 8 and verse 9, it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said unto Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even to death. You see, here's the point I want you to understand here. When we believe, when we believe, when we convince ourselves that we have a right to something, that, that we have the right to have this thing, and then God takes it away from us, if we're not careful, giant of bitterness will rise up in our hearts. There's the contamination of bitterness, the causes of bitterness. But then I want you to notice number three, the characteristics of it. 
the characteristics of it. I want to notice several things here. First of all, I want you to notice that bitterness is focused. Bitterness is focused. Educators are all familiar with the, with the saying that repetition is the key to learning. Repetition is the key to learning. By the way, the same thing is true with, with bitterness. You see, bitterness is able to become a dangerous giant that, that controls our lives when we are so focused on the wrong that has been done. And the reason why we are so focused is simply because we keep reviewing it in our mind. It's like the fellow who keeps hitting the replay button. The, they back up and replay and back up and replay and back up and replay and, and they keep reviewing, they keep replaying and, and many times that's exactly what we do in our minds with the hurts and the wrongs that someone has done to us. We keep reviewing it, we keep replaying it in our mind until it becomes our focal point. And the result is bitterness. Bitterness is focused. Not only that, bitterness is one-sided. It's one-sided. In other words, bitterness grows when our focus is the fault of someone else. While we proudly refuse to acknowledge the part that we have played in the situation. I, I've learned through the years in counseling with people that usually every, every difficulty between people has three sides. There's one side. There's the other side. And then in the middle there somewhere, that's where you find the truth. That's where you find the truth. And, and therefore, James said this in James chapter 3, verse number 14. If ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. You see, the bottom line is simply this. Bitterness believes what it wants to believe. It believes what it wants to believe. And, and bitterness will always cause a person to strive to present themselves in the very best possible way. But see, when we do that, we are lying against the truth. We're lying against the truth. Bitterness, it's focused. Bitterness, it's one-sided. Letter C, bitterness is stubborn. It's stubborn. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 15, the Lord Jesus, do you remember, he's, he, he's giving the Sermon on the Mount. And he makes this statement in Matthew chapter 6, verse 15, But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father Forgive your trespasses. In other words, bitterness grows when a person stubbornly says, I don't care what God says. And I don't care what the Bible says. I will not forgive. I will not forgive. Bitterness, bottom line, bitterness refuses to be reconciled. It refuses to be reconciled. You, you must remember that anger comes from the offense that is done to us, but bitterness is independent of the offender. Anger comes because of what somebody does, but bitterness is something that comes from within our own self. It comes from within our own self. And so the bottom line is simply that when the giant of bitterness is ruling in our life, the one who caused the offense is no longer the real issue. The real issue is our stubborn rebellion against God. And that is a most heavy load to carry. Not only is bitterness focused, not only is it one-sided and stubborn, letter D, bitterness is revealing. It's revealing. In James chapter 3, verse 11, the Bible says, Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? In, in other words, a fountain that is, that is putting out sweet water, you know, when you come back to it later, will it be putting out bitter water? And of course, this is a, it's a rhetorical question. The obvious answer is no. Obvious answer is no. If, if you were to take a, a bottle of pure, fresh water, and you were to take that bottle and you were to shake it very violently, 
and, and, and you were to shake it all up. You, you know what would happen when you, when you poured out the water? It would be still sweet, right? It, it would still be good. It would still be fresh. And in the very same way, if we are filled with the Holy Spirit, no matter how violently our life may be shaken by the circumstances that we have to deal with, by the people that we have to deal with, no matter how violently our lives may be shaken by the offenses of some offender, in spite of all of that, our words and our actions will not be tainted with bitterness, but rather they will be marked by gentleness and kindness and goodness and forgiveness. There's the contamination of bitterness. There's the causes of bitterness, the characteristics of bitterness. And then last of all, I want you to notice with me, number four, the cure of it, the cure of it. How do we get rid of this giant of bitterness? How do we get rid of it? How do we defeat it? Let me mention a couple of points here very quickly. Letter A, receive God's grace. Receive God's grace. You, you remember we said that bitterness comes when we fail to follow peace by extending the grace of God to others. We saw that in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 and verse 15. But in order to do that, in order to do that, we need to follow the admonition in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, where it says, let us therefore. Now, if you go back and look at the context, the therefore is simply because of the fact we have a great high priest. And so because we have this great high priest, the Bible says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy, notice it, and find grace to help in the time of need, when we are hurt by someone, when we're offended by someone, it's not natural to forgive. The natural instinct is we, we want revenge. We want revenge. You know the old saying, I don't get mad, I get even, right? And, and that's, that's natural, that's natural. Our inclination then, our natural inclination is that we become bitter. Bitterness, it's a natural thing. And so therefore, here's what we need. We need God's grace. We need God's grace to help us in our time of need to destroy this giant of bitterness. We need to receive. We need to receive God's grace. Let her be. We need to give godly grace. We need to give godly grace. Now that does not mean that we forget all about the wrong that has been done to us. That, that does not mean that we totally ignore and forget all about the hurt that we have felt because of what someone said or what someone did. Rather, what it means is, is that we do not use their offense as a battering ram to tear down the offender. Rather, we extend to them the grace that we have received from God. We extend that same grace to the one who has offended us, just as God has extended grace to those of us who have offended him. I want you to think about the oyster as we bring this to a close. You know, the oyster takes a, you get a little piece of sand in his shell and, and the oyster turns the irritation caused by that grain of sand in its shell into a precious pearl. Many times God allows, he allows annoying circumstances to come into our lives. And those circumstances, please listen carefully, those circumstances will either do something to us or they will do something for us. Those difficult circumstances that God allows to come into our lives, they'll either do something to us or they'll do something for us. And what is done, what is done, will always be determined by how we choose to respond to the giant of bitterness. Whether we allow it to, to live and to grow or, or whether we cut it out by the root. May God help us to choose wisely and never allow this giant of bitterness 
to get a stronghold in our hearts and in our lives. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word tonight. Take these few thoughts and apply them in each heart and in each life, we pray in Jesus' name. And for Jesus' sake, amen. God bless you.